Hi, welcome back. Today we're going to begin our discussion about market failures by uh, beginning to discuss this concept known as externalities. And so today our goal is to identify what are externalities and how they impact the market. We'll distinguish between positive and ex uh, negative externalities. And we'll discuss the concept of the Coase theorem as well as Pigouvian subsidies and taxes as ways to address the problems that uh, externalities create for the market. And all this information is in Chapter 17 of your textbook. We're going to begin first by talking about the fact that every decision we make has both a private and external impact on things. Not only do, do my decisions affect me, but in some cases my decisions, uh, decisions may affect you or other people around me. Uh, for example, I might choose to do some home improvement. Maybe the outside of my house is a really ugly yellow color and I want to go ahead and paint it um, brown or something that's a little bit less um, jarring to the eye. So for me, the private benefit here is that I have a nicer house, it's in better shape, it looks better to me, I'm much happier with it, but it also has a social benefit or an external benefit in the sense that my neighbors now enjoy higher property values because there's not an eyesore in the neighborhood. And so anytime we see a decision where um, there are both private and social impacts, we begin to talk about the presence of what are known as externalities. Externalities will exist anytime there are external impacts to someone's decision. And those impacts can be both positive or negative. Um, an example of a negative would be an ex external cost, be anything that hurts other people as a result of my decision, uh, whereas positive externalities are things that help other people um, other than myself based on my decision. So we can look at some examples. Pollution, for example, is an externality. It creates a cost to other people in the form of, uh, of dirtier air uh, or water. So it's a negative externality. If your neighbor's dog barks at the moon all night, um, that de decision to allow their dog to bark may not hurt your neighbor because he's used to it, but it certainly hurts you. It has an external cost, and so it's a negative externality. Or the flu shot, where in, in this case, people getting the flu shot is actually a positive for uh, society because fewer people contracting the flu means a, a healthier um, and safer community. So some of these decisions have a negative impact and some have a positive impact. But in all cases, if there is some sort of impact beyond um, the impact to the individual who made the decision, we have what are known as externalities. Now, externalities create a certain degree of inefficiency. It's a market failure. Um, and, and we want to look at why. I mean, in essence, we can look at a, the supply and demand for uh, pollution, and we could say that the supply is the marginal social cost, and the demand would be the marginal social benefit. Uh, marginal social cost is essentially the supply because um, as the quantity of pollution increases, the, the cost or the price of that decision rises with it. Um, and, and marginal social benefit is sort of the demand in the sense that um, as the, the cost of pollution rises to me, um, I'll want less of it. And so we could look and say in a perfect world, we would look at the marginal social cost, the impact of the community, and the marginal social benefit, the impact, uh, positive impact to the community, find where they intersect, and that would be the optimal uh, amount of pollution. The problem is, or the reality is, that um, if you're a polluter, you don't take into account the impact on the culture or the society. You only look towards yourself. And so um, in an unregulated world, a uh, polluter would look until he finds his marginal social benefit is equal to zero. There's no more gain for him, uh, the polluter, in, uh, in terms of benefit. And at that point where there's no more additional benefit is where um, a unregulated producer would, would choose to pollute. And so we can see that in that world, Q market would be the amount of pollution that we have. But then we see that um, that's, that's obviously a problem in the sense that uh, at that level of pollution, the cost to society is $400 uh, per ton of emissions. And so clearly there is some sort of cost that needs to be incorporated or or considered when making a decision because when we look at the supply and demand and the intersection really the optimal level of pollution was at Q optimum um, and at a price of $200 per ton of emissions and so um, exper externalities can lead in some cases to either overproduction of a negative or underproduction of a positive. 
So with eg negative externalities, essentially what we see is that um, our willingness to supply negative externalities is going to be greater than uh, what is socially efficient. And so we'll get, end up oversupplying um, negative things. And when it comes to positive externalities, uh, we see that our, our demand for uh, those positive things is uh, much less than the socially acceptable level or socially optimal level uh, because it costs us more to get to that socially um, efficient level than uh, we're willing to pay. And so we underproduce good things. Um, in essence, negative externalities lead to the overproduction of bad and positive externalities, the presence of positive externalities leads us to an underproduction of positive things without some sort of external force uh, working on us. So how can we overcome these inefficiencies? Well, there are a couple of ways to do it. One is what we call the Coase Theorem. And the Coase Theorem basically says that private markets can arrive at a socially efficient outcome in all cases as long as uh, property rights are clearly defined so we know who has the right to, uh, to create the externality and that our transaction costs are low, which means that um, the cost of paying somebody to either stop doing something negative or encourage them to, uh, to do something positive are low. As long as it doesn't cost as much to make a transaction, then uh, we're in good shape. And so, for example, the Coast Theorem would say that if you're in a dorm room and uh, your neighbor likes to play a uh, death metal at a really high volume and you find it tremendously painful to listen to, um, it's a negative externality because your neighbor doesn't bother him. He doesn't take into account the fact that it might bother you. And so he's going to produce a certain amount of death metal that's beyond the socially optimal level. And so the Coast Theorem says that we can get to a more optimal level um, of death metal by identifying who's got the right. Does your neighbor have the right to play his music or do you have a right to, um, to sit in quiet? Either one is fine. It doesn't really matter because in the case of your neighbor having the right, you just go up to him and say, look, I understand you have a right to play death metal, but I would like to pay you to stop. Essentially, um, you are you're covering the, the loss to him of being able to listen to his music and you could get to an optimal level that way. If you have the right to be able to sit in quiet, then your neighbor could come to you and say, I understand that you want quiet, but I like my death metal, and I know there's a cost to you, so let me compensate you by uh, paying you a certain amount of money to, to allow me to play death metal. In either case, you're going to end up with the, the socially optimal um, level, as long as you have these clearly defined rights. The goal here is for people to internalize either the cost or the benefit to get them um, through through the pricing system to take into account either the social benefit or the social cost of their decisions. The Coast of the Arm works really, really well, except in cases where uh, communication costs are high. If your ability to be able to communicate and discuss and negotiate with your neighbor um, is difficult for some reason, then it's the Coast Theorem will begin to fail us. Um, or if creating what are known as legally binding agreements are costly. If, it, if you have to go through a lawyer to go through this whole process or something like that, then um, you'll find that it's more difficult uh, to, to come to an agreement and Coast Theorem won't work. Uh, or if there are any sort of delays that increase the cost of, um, of bargain, bargaining. If it takes a long time to come to a deal, if someone's holding out for as good a deal as they can get, something like that, then we won't get to that social uh, optimum. But in general, as long as there are low transaction costs and clearly defined rights, we can come to a solution. Now let's take just a couple minutes to look at how to graph it and to identify what are known as Pigouvian taxes or Pigouvian subsidies, which are the, uh, the amount of payments that would be necessary to get us to a socially optimum output um, for each of the, the activities that leads to an externality. Um, we talked about marginal social benefit, and marginal social benefit takes into account both the marginal personal benefit plus the marginal external benefit. So not only what do I get out of it, but what do people outside of me get out of my activity or my behavior. And if there's a world where there are no externalities, then our marginal social benefit is equal to my marginal personal benefit, and that's essentially our demand curve. And so, in the case of a positive externality, like flu shots, for example, we could say that the, um, the, 
market output uh, comes to my personal demand and then supply leads to this level of, um, of flu shots being given. Clearly, because it's an, a positive externality, it's fewer flu shots than what we really want because I haven't taken into account the marginal social benefit of flu shots. Not only have I not done that, but what I've done is said my personal benefit is all that matters, but when I take my personal benefit and add the external benefit, I have this demand curve which essentially shifts to the right and leaves us with a much more efficient level of, uh, of flu shots. What we also see is that at the current market level of flu shots, the uh, social benefit um, is much higher uh, than what we're actually experiencing as far as the price. In order to, to get the socially beneficial level of flu shots, it would cost us more, essentially. And so we see that this area and this triangle here essentially amounts to dead weight loss. And dead weight loss clearly is not, not helpful because that means that there are transactions, beneficial transactions that could go on um, that are not. And so how do we get rid of dead weight loss in the case of a positive externality? We can use what's known as the Paguvian subsidy. It's named after an economist with the last name of Pagu. And the subsidy basically encourages activity with external benefits. It says, um, we know that to take action that's beneficial to society, it's going to cost you, the actor, the, the consumer, uh, more than you were willing to pay. And so um, we, the external actors, maybe it's the government, for example, will pay a portion of your costs to encourage you to take this more beneficial uh, activity or behavior in order to create the positive externality. So it basically reduces the cost to the individual of pursuing optimal behavior. The flip side, of course, is we have marginal social costs, which, like marginal social benefits, basically takes my personal cost of an activity and adds to it the marginal external cost of the activity. And in a world where there are no externalities, the marginal social cost would be equal to my marginal personal cost, and that would essentially be the supply of whatever the behavior is. And so we can look in the case of um, livestock. Raising livestock has some marginal social benefits, but it also has some, some costs, social costs, not only to the uh, individual farmer, but to our environment, because uh, raising livestock on farms creates more methane gas, it creates muck and, um, and other things which are generally uh, negative in many cases. It could cause uh, pollution of water or something like that. So in that case, the personal cost to the farmer um, is what he takes into account, and so there'll be a certain quantity of livestock that he will raise and that would be the quant market quantity, but there's that additional cost to the environment to the social well-being that's not being taken into consideration. And when it does, we find that the, the supply of livestock shifts essentially to the left so that our optimal level is less than what we're producing because, again, the negative externality leads to overproduction. And so, in essence, we need to take into account this marginal social cost, and we see that um, the cost for the in order to get to the efficient level of, of um, livestock, there's there's a cost there that the uh, the farmer is not taking into account, and so we create a new set of dead weight loss in this area, where there are transactions that we could actually make people better off without making people worse off, and so in order to eliminate it, we might want to use a Paguvian tax, in which case it's a behavior a payment that discourages behavior by helping. Uh, the individual internalize the cost. Essentially, by taxing the individual, they begin to um, see the actual cost of society, and that will affect or alter their behavior. And so in this case, the consumer would be the one paying a portion of the cost of society in order to um, increase the cost of suboptimal behavior and reduce the amount of the negative externality that exists. And so in order to identify the appropriate Paguvian subsidy or tax, um, what we, we would do is look for the point at which marginal social benefit is equal to marginal social cost. So at the point at which my personal and external benefit um, is equal to my personal and external cost, that tells me my optimal level of, um, of the externality, and that price is what would be our Paguvian subsidy or tax. That essentially tells us how much it would cost to internalize it. Um, 
to help you understand that, we'll just look for pollution for a second, where uh, if I'm a polluter, I only look at my marginal social benefit, and I see then that for me, I go all the way down until the marginal uh, social benefit is zero and pollute to that point because I'm not taking into account marginal social cost. But if I charge um, a Pigouvian tax of, say, $200 in this case, essentially what that does is by raising the price of my behavior, I'm moving along the demand curve because a change in price leads to a movement along the curve, and I will move along the curve until I get to this optimum level at $200. So if I can raise the price by $200, I'm going to get the optimal level of pollution. So when you're looking to identify the appropriate Pigouvian tax, look for the intersection of marginal social benefit and marginal social cost, and that will tell you what the amount should be either for the Pigouvian subsidy or tax. We're going to do some more practice. I encourage you to read your book, come into class, and uh, I'll try and answer your questions when we get there. See you then.